Artificial intelligence is here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Daniel Lopez. This is the AI Education Conversation, where we explore the opportunities, risks, and the impacts of AI across education. Let's jump in. What's up, everyone? For those of you in the United States, hope you enjoyed the long weekend. For those of you outside of the United States, hope your week is, you're having a great, strong start to the week. Over the past 19 weeks, so much has happened regarding AI and its impact on education. And I think along the way, It is important that we continue to not just learn new things, continue to grow, continue to ask questions, but we also sometimes have to take time to pause, reflect on what we've learned, and be able to just really synthesize the information at hand. Today's episode is dedicated to just that. We're going to take some time today to reflect on all that we've learned over the last 19 weeks. Before we do, as always, let's jump into a few AI updates, and then we will jump into our reflection here. Got a big science theme. In our updates in AI today, I think you all are really going to enjoy this. I know I did. Uh, These updates for me, in many sense, really allowed me to lean into the opportunity in the best case scenarios for using AI and AI tools to be able to help humanity. And so I'm excited to share some of those updates with you. Let's start off first with this one. A brain reading device empowered by AI has successfully restored a paraplegic man's ability to walk. You heard that right. Basically, there were some Swiss and French neuroscientists who developed an apparatus that uses AI machine learning. They installed something into a man's brain, some kind of uh, helmet or electrodes, if you will. And then in the spine, they installed a small device as well. And then through AI learning, these two apparatuses were able to communicate with each other and the impact of that gentleman named Jert Jan Oksam, who was paralyzed in 2011 due to a cycling accident. He's now able to stand, walk short distances, and climb stairs. So that was amazing. I was super excited to just see that. That for me is just feels like a really tremendous use of AI technology, and I was really happy to see how this played out. Long term, the scientists recommended that their goal is to make this to where it becomes even more sustainable. My understanding from the article, which I'll link in our show notes as we always do, is that some of these devices are rather large, so their goal is to make them more minimally intrusive and and more miniature uh, over time. But a very, very big stride um, and a very big development, the idea that we can now install technology in our brains, in our spines, to be able to allow folks who may have been in some type of accidents which have impaired their ability to do things such as walking. And now there's hope. Now there's hope for those folks. Transitioning to a new update, the National Eating Disorder Association, NIDA, is reportedly replacing their help, uh, helpline staff with an AI chatbot named Tessa, according to NPR. I'm going to link the full interview that NPR had listed as a part of this as well, so you all can check it out. There was a little bit of an interesting development with this particular story, but I think there's some big questions that it brings up around the role for AI, especially as it relates to health and human services here. So at a high level, NIDA, what they're going to be uh, doing, as I just mentioned, they're replacing their helpline staff with this AI chatbot named Tessa. Reportedly, they're receiving annually about 70,000 calls a year to their helpline. So that's a quite large, high volume of calls that are now, instead of engaging with real humans, are going to be engaging with Tessa. There's potentially some political issues or some other workforce issues related to this um, that they kind of get into here. It sounds like potentially part of the decision to transition to Tessa 
over continuing to invest in the staff may have been related to the fact that they were not paying the workers. It was uh, mostly relying heavily on the volunteer staff. Workers were in the process of unionizing. And then now this is happening at the same time where they're transitioning to it. There's also a little bit of a, a reaction from some of the former re uh, workers as well as critics that they're concerned about just the human empathy that relates to this. As you can imagine, when folks are calling into the NIDA crisis text line and hotline here, they're calling in on behalf of very sensitive issues, right? They're calling in based on body positivity, potentially more serious eating disorders or those types of things, which may be impacting them. This is, you know, this is, this is now very high stakes conversations in terms of conversations that we are positioning an AI chatbot to be able to engage with people on. Um, and I think we'll just kind of have to see what happens here in terms of, this is a pretty large social experiment in terms to see how well, how effective Tessa in this particular case will be with supporting individuals uh, with some of the challenges that they're facing here as they're going through this. The empathy is the big piece. We'll have to just see how generally how they're responding to this. But I think generally speaking, the question really it brings up for me as I'm looking at this is I know that across not just very human health services related functions like these crisis hotlines, but really as we hyper focus on education specifically, this is a big issue here, right? The issue is, is that there's a, there's a high need for mental social services for students, for teachers, for school landscapes in general. Oftentimes staff is burnt out. Staff could use support. Sometimes these, these types of uh, supports are just generally understaffed, right? And if there is an opportunity to use AI, I would imagine some folks would be receptive to it, but very similar to, you know, this particular update, I would imagine that there's also going to be some concerns with how much we actually want to integrate AI with these very, in these very high stake circumstances, because again, it's not human, right? There's going to be a limit to, to, to the extent to which it can offer advice to console to support somebody that is in crisis. And we really just, I think, have to go through this calculus and this matrix and determine how, to what extent are we willing to use AI tools and position AI tools to support us through very high stakes conversations and high stakes situations when the alternative may actually be currently under resources, under utilization, or just a staff that maybe doesn't actually have the bandwidth to support the need that is apparent. So something to keep our eye on. I thought that was a very interesting update. I'm going to share the full interview from NPR in the show notes so that you all can check it out if you're very interested in diving deeper here. Lastly, very interesting coming out of MIT and McMaster University. So researchers at both of those institutions were able to use an artificial intelligence algorithm, machine learning, to identify a new antibiotic that can kill superbugs. So in particular, the superbug that they were targeting is one, and, and again, I'm, not, I'm no expert at speaking some of these Latin terms here, but it's called A. Baumani. And so if, just to provide a little bit of the context on these superbugs, as many of us know, when we're talking about using those Lysol wipes or those Clorox wipes and they say killing 99.9% .9 of bugs, this is that 0.001% that we're talking about that they can't kill, right? Oftentimes when you're talking in particular about uh, spaces like hospitals, where they're going to be very sterile environments. They're going to be cleaning a lot. These are the bugs that oftentimes are resistant to any type of antibiotics and those types of things coming out. And what they, so re, what researchers were able to do is they were able to create this algorithm and then pulling from a library of nearly 7,000 potential drug compounds, they basically trained the, the AI algorithm to evaluate whether a chemical compound can inhibit the growth of this superbug. And then they actually found that there is one that potentially could do this. And so for me, this feels very promising. I'm, my hope is that given how fast these updates continue to develop and how fast we've seen some of the positives of AI and leveraging AI, not just in education, but across the field here, across many different sectors, my hope is that one day I wake up and I see that AI has been used to cure cancer. That's my hope. 
That's my dream. I hope that that continues to happen, and I hope that we can work towards that one day. But in the in the short term, I was very, very excited to be able to share with you some of these developments, specifically within medicine in the medical field. We're going to transition now to talk about what we've learned over the last 19 weeks as it relates to AI and its impact in education, because we've learned a lot. And I really want to share, just to provide a quick overview before we really jump in here, the goal is really going to be to check in on three different facets and to be able to talk about what I initially thought versus where we're at now. Those three different facets are going to be these three things. How, how is it looking across access, right? How AI and education, those who want to be able to access it, are they accessing it? We're going to deep dive and talk about that. We're going to talk about privacy, and then we're going to talk about opportunity slash risks. I'm going to throw in some risks uh, as well within that last category, but we're going to talk, talk about it within those three different divisions there. And with that being said, let's jump on and get into this conversation here. All right, let's start first with access. When I think access across AI education and what we've learned over the past 19 weeks, here's a couple of things first and foremost I think we need to break down when we talk about access. Access for me means a couple of things. I think it means the general use of access of technology, right? Can our school communities actually, do they actually have the technology needed to access AI, AI chatbots, chat GPT, et cetera? I think it also means is AI accessible for all people to use effectively? Is it easy to use? Is it complicated? What is the experience of actually using AI like? And then lastly, I think fundamentally we have to answer the question, are people using it, right? Let's start first with access of technology. I think in my perspective over the last 19 weeks and really looking at the period in education in my personal experience, pre-2019 to where we are today, post-pandemic, I would say that generally being able to identify, leverage technology to be able to use AI, chatbots in particular, I think has been easier and we have never been better positioned to use these AI tools than we are now. I think the pandemic brought a massive tech download across schools and the skill gap to using tech effectively increased, right? A lot of people during the pandemic, had no idea how to use things such as Zoom and do video calls and do blended and virtual learning. But school communities across the board really quickly had to learn how to do that at least proficiently <laughs> and be able to use technology in a very deep way. And prior to that, many school communities may have been on different ends of the spectrum around their use of technology in the classroom. That being said now, again, I think most schools have one-to-one -one laptop device policies. Even in rural communities, I think the access and usage of technology has increased, maybe not to the extent of urban community, urban communities and major cities on the coast, but I do think it has increased significantly, again, because of the pandemic. I do think that there still exist concerns around AI implementation in general and the gap when schools and underserved communities, as an example, they may very similar to other issues and other opportunities that come up when they are introduced to school communities. Just in my experience, what tends to happen is schools and underserved communities end up not having either the resources, the staff, or the infrastructure, or the bandwidth to be able to learn, engage, and really quickly adapt to a new paradigm shift in the workforce landscape and the technological landscape. Heck, even as you're talking about education standards in a learning landscape, Oftentimes, there's a little bit of a slower shift that takes place in underserved communities and schools in underserved communities. In affluent communities, as we know, that learning curve tends to be a lot smaller, right? They, they tend to have the resources, the networks, the expertise, the financial resources to be able to do it, the bandwidth to be able to do it, right, and to be able to implement these things. So I am still very much concerned, and this is something that some of the principles we brought on in earlier episodes said as well, which is AI does have the potential to exacerbate some of the current inequities that do exist in education. And so we definitely have to keep a watchful eye on that. We really have to ask ourselves what type of opportunities, resources, 
and supports are we going to be providing schools and underserved communities to do that? So that's how I might generally respond to the, the accessibility for school communities to use this effectively. Now, when we're talking about the access of folks being able to use AI and can they actually use it well, right? Are they, is, is there a low barrier to entry as it relates to being able to use AI if you have never used anything like it before and you've never been in a class to learn how to use AI tools? I think in those cases, I would say generally, I do think chatbots relative to other technological tools that exist out there. I mean, if we're even getting hyper concrete here, something like Microsoft Office and Suite Tools or Google Docs and Google Tools, Google Docs, Google Sheets, those types of things. I would say that chatbots are just as easy, if not easier to use than those types of things, right? You, you can be someone with pretty basic te technological capabilities. Very quickly, you can log into one of these portals or now, I mean, you don't even have to log in. You can go to something like Bing or you can go to Bard and those are just extensions that exist as a part of a search engine and it's just the bar and you just start asking questions. You start asking it to complete tasks and it does it, right? So I would say the basic concept of understanding how to use an AI chatbot, I think is pretty easy to use. And I would say that generally it is pretty accessible. The caveat though, is that I think to understand how to use it and to use it very basically is very easy to do. But I think the the barrier to getting pretty good at using it, right, and being able to use it as an expert level is actually a lot more complicated than it seems, right? To be able to do that, a lot of folks will call this what's a common term that I've noticed comes up quite a bit recently is called prompt engineering. And there's like this whole field of prompt engineering that has started to come up. And fundamentally, it is exactly what it sounds like, which is you can ask one of these search bars, you can ask ChatGPT to do something very simply, and it's going to give you a simple response, or it's going to give you a vague response. But if you're able to set up a scenario very thoughtfully, let's say that instead of asking ChatGPT to write you a lesson plan, a third grade lesson plan, that's the prompt that you enter. Well, it's going to give you a very basic third grade lesson plan. But now if you say, okay, ChatGPT, I want you to uh, write me a third grade lesson plan specifically focused on balancing chemical equations. I want this to include key points. I want it to include three to four options for activities. I want it to include differentiation for ESL students and for SPED students. I want it to include an exit ticket. Now, if you put that level of specificity, you're going to get a very different product from JetGPT or any of these chatbots in terms of your response. Then you can continue to refine based on what it provides. When it provides you that template, you can even say, okay, get even more specific. Now, I want you to provide me three more examples for how to differentiate this activity. I also want you to provide me one option that includes an option for kinesthetic learners, right? And you can continue to get smart. Now, to be able to do that, though, it takes two, there's two skill gaps that have to be addressed. Number one, you have to know what questions to ask, and you have to know the capabilities of this technology, or you have to be willing to just jump in and discover it. Number two, you got to know your content expertise pretty well, right? You have to be be able to ask it questions based on a, a, an area, a sector, a knowledge base that you know and understand very well and, and have a strong command of so that you can use utilize this technology effectively to be able to support you with the product that you're asking it to do. So I think that that's what I would offer there. I do think that when it comes to even more sophisticated tools, like as an example, in our second episode, we highlighted quite a bit um, Dolly 2, which is a tool from OpenAI as well, very similar to ChatGPT, which actually produces text to images. And so I showed an example there how you can create a high school logo, redo your whole high school logo uh, in, in using prompts to be able to do that. I would say my advice there is generally the same. And again, the challenge there is if you're not somebody with a graphic design background, sometimes there's very hyper-specific terminology that you may want to use uh, from that from that field, right? Things such as min minimalist, symmetrical, uh, specific color palettes, which if you don't do it specifically, it may not give you an image that looks really cool. If you just put, I want a lion with a crown on it, it may give you some, it'll give you some images really fast, which is great, but it may not give you the specific vision you have in your head. And so it takes time, a lot of time to be able to refine. But once you learn it, you learn it, right? There's a lot of people, as we know now, that have also gotten really sophisticated with not just using text to image, but also things such as text to video, text to music. Those things are around as well. 
What I would also offer though, is that even though there's a steeper learning curve on these types of tools relative to ChatGPT, which is just text to text, it's not necessarily more difficult than conventional tools, right? Because if you're comparing it to how difficult is it, you, is it to use Dolly 2 compared to Photoshop? I mean, in my opinion, Photoshop's way harder and it takes way longer. I mean, maybe not now because Photoshop has added AI tools, just like everybody else has, or a lot of these big tech, tech companies have. But if you're comparing the process of being able to engineer specific prompts compared to having to actually upload an image, do all this like little coloring using all these little tools at the bar to do those things. I mean, there's there's only there's going to be a lot smaller pool of people that actually understand how to do those things well compared to people who can draft a very thoughtful sentence. So in those ways, it is actually still less of a barrier to entry than it is to use, uh, again, more of the conventional tools. Now to this last question related to access, are people actually using it? It's a complicated question, and I do think it continues to evolve. On the one hand, when ChatGPT came out in November, it was the fastest downloaded application of all time. You pretty much think of any application that has been out there, Netflix, um, you know, Angry Birds, I guess, was a really popular app that came out. There's a lot of uh, graphics and articles that came out a few months ago showing that the, the rate at which it grew and then the total number of downloads superpassed everything. So, so at a high level, there's a lot of people using tools like ChatGPT and AI. There's no doubt about that. Even looking at last week, so last week in my previous episode, I mentioned that ChatGPT uh, just created a cell phone app that you can use. I've used it. I've downloaded it. I've already been using it. That app in the first week that it was out, it was downloaded 500,000 times in the very first week. Now, if we get a little bit more specific here when we're talking about what this potentially means for education, the one of the initial studies that I referenced a couple of episodes ago was that that initial survey of 1,000 teachers and 1,000 students around AI tools that the Walton Family Foundation had endorsed and had distributed. Overall, what that seems to describe is that folks in school communities, in particular teachers and students, they have a pretty positive sentiment around AI tools, right? There was a very specific bullet point in that survey. And again, you can go back and listen to episode 10 where I referenced to this whole survey where we found that 88% of the teachers who'd used AI tools and 79% of the students who have used it say that it, had, it, they, it has a positive impact on their workflows and their experience. So overall, it does seem like there are some positive indicators that suggest that number one, a lot of folks are using them, a lot of folks are using these tools and they generally are, are providing a positive experience on humanity. That being said, I'm still a little bit of skip, uh, a little bit skeptical that we've hit a tipping point. I've said this and I've been very open uh, about this on, on previous episodes and I continue to hold that point at this particular moment. Let me provide a little bit of specific context as to why I feel this way. Number one, as you all know, I'm very connected to school communities across Massachusetts, Texas, a little bit in California. And what I found across the majority of conversations that I've had, and again, I've had conversations with school district leaders, I'm having conversations with practitioners in schools, I'm having conversations with parents and students. What I find is AI is still not in the general conversation within schools. I'm not finding that generally as I'm walking down the hallways or I'm talking general just small talk conversations in schools that folks are talking about this, it's usually still a small minority of folks within schools who are really just fired up, passionate about these tools and actually engaging with these tools in, in a meaningful way. That being said, that doesn't mean that we can't hit this tipping point. That doesn't mean that you know we're not there yet. I would also offer just before I go too far here, the other thing that I would, I think we all know is that as it has related to conversations around access and adoption of AI in school communities, we've also learned from our, the principals, from the teachers that have come onto the show in the previous episodes, we've also learned that it's been mostly academic focus, right? It's mostly been around cheating, plagiarism, how it can create an essay and how that's no longer maybe a, a product that has come into schools. That, that has continued to be the conversation that has happened in schools. And then after that conversation, what I've what I have heard from folks is conversations at this particular moment appear to have have flatlined a little bit. Now, do I think that's a bad thing, or do I not understand where that's coming from? No, I don't think it's a bad thing. Why? Because I understand how school innovation cycles work. I think anybody who works in schools knows that the cycle for innovation occurs a little bit differently than in, than it does in business and tech sectors. Schools do their strategic planning in the summer. So what that I think means is over the next couple of months here, 
really starting in June, going up until August, I do think we're going to see a multitude of conversations, dialogue around AI and its use cases in, in education. I think that as teachers get a lot of sleep again, as they become whole again, as school leaders get some sleep and get some rest, students are out of schools, everybody's starting to recharge and get some of their mental bandwidth back and be able to think more innovatively. I do think there's going to be some more strategic planning conversations around to what extent AI will be in schools next year. Now, that being said, we'll have to see what that means, right? It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see classrooms totally flip next year, but I do think there are going to be some critical conversations around a lot of different school communities next year. We already are starting to see it in small doses, right? As an example, and I'll post this in the show notes as well, Chalkbeat recently published a big article by New York City chancellors who recently came out and said, hey, when we initially banned uh, chat GPT and AI tools in our schools, we were wrong. We shouldn't have done that. Here's ways in which we've, uh, during that banning, we've actually attempted to learn, really take that time to pause, reflect, learn, and how we're thinking about using them in the future. Personally, I think that's phenomenal. I personally don't think he needed to apologize for doing that because as I said, and really the inspiration for my entire podcast over this 19 weeks was partially the New York City public schools banning. And as I said, there was a lot of flack fallout that NYC public schools got from in particular folks in business and tech spaces because of their action. But I knew what it meant. For me, the banning didn't mean it was gone forever. Banning meant pause. Banning meant pause. Let's take time to think about it. Let's take time to figure this out. And then we will we will adjust as we need to. And in many cases across school communities, that's just the way that things operate. Now, I want to offer as well a couple of predictions across access that I, that I would offer, I, I think, as we continue to head to the future here, head to the summer months, head towards some of these, these months of strategic planning across school communities. First, I do think as more educators and groups focused on access come onto the scene, you know, I'm really thinking, you know, about the episode we did with the deal and Brad from Uncharted AI as an example, to lifelong educators now in a position and really focused on trying to get AI tools into the hands of educators, trying to get them to understand how these things work, how they can make their lives easier. I think as more of those types of things happen, I would imagine that AI usage and the diversity of how these tools are used across schools is going to increase as we go into next year. Again, how much it will increase, not really sure, but I don't uh, envision a world where when we look back on some of the, the data and some of the surveys that we saw earlier in the year, that it will be low numbers of AI. I think the conversation is going to get more intense as we get into next year, I think is what I'm trying to say. Prediction number two, I do think that as big tech companies, Google in particular, Microsoft and OpenAI in particular, as they continue to integrate AI tools into many of the tech tools that we already use, things such as Google Docs, Google Sheets, Microsoft suites of tools. And we start to see those little bars there. All of a sudden, we're in a Microsoft PowerPoint. And then all of a sudden, we see that there's a chat bot there that says, hey, if you ask me a question, I can help you to, to lay out this entire presentation with just a couple of bullet points. I think some folks are naturally and intuitively just going to figure out how to use some of these tools because it's integrated into things that they already use within their work stream, right? So these tech companies are becoming even more sophisticated as to how they're bringing these tools in to really increase usage. And I do think that that is going to lessen the learning curve for some of these tools. And I do imagine that there's going to be an increase in adoption as a result. My last prediction across access, I do think that as the, the, the government continues providing oversight and regulation on AI, my personal hope is that they prioritize equity, funding, guidance, and resources for schools from underserved communities in particular to be able to implement AI. There was a recent paper by the, uh, the Office of Educational Technology within the U.S. Department of Education, uh, which really talks about guidelines and frameworks and recommendations for AI and teaching and learning. I'm really, really excited to share more about that paper. We're going to deep dive into it in a future episode. So I just want to kind of throw out a little bit of a, of a, a bone there for now. But my hope is that more of these types of things, intellectual frameworks, actual funding and dollars, and those types of resources will continue to come from government entities as, as we continue to, to set the expectation and hope that schools will use AI in some capacity within their schools. It's not going to happen 
exclusively with school initiative. It is going to take, I think, government entities to support this effort as well, or technology companies who also continue to uh, take extra strides to accommodate, in particular, schools and districts to integrate AI tools. Let's transition now and talk about privacy. As we all know, this is a big one, right? Privacy has had big rumblings, and this has been uh, arguably the biggest barrier towards even further AI integration across the board. Initially, a lot of schools ended up saying no to AI tools because of privacy. I already mentioned NYC. I will kind of uh, just kind of leave that there for now. But as I mentioned, they recently changed their tune. But I think there's a lot of big questions that remain around privacy. We learned that the issue around privacy over the last 19 episodes, what we've learned is that it's pretty complex. Privacy is not a simple issue and it's complex. It's complex for a multitude of reasons. Let's briefly talk about some of the reasons why it's complex. Number one, it's complex because AI companies do use your information and they use public internet information to train the models. So they're not necessarily copy copywriting verbatim some of the information and publicizing it, but what they're doing is they're taking intellectual property they're taking publicly available images, text, information, and they're using that to train the models. As a result, there's been a lot of copyright issues that have come up, right? We know that there's there's the, the writer's uh, strike that has come up around AI tools. There's also been a lot of lawsuits that have come up specifically around visual artists who are suing AI companies because their models were trained around their paintings, their images, their work, and then they that happened without their consent or any compensation. We've also seen that a lot of music right, has been uh, compilated by AI using famous artists, right? Drake has been, I think, uh, very popular amongst a lot of these songs, honestly. And again, I I think a lot of them are very good. Again, I don't want to sit here and lie. I think some of the songs have been fire, right? We've talked about some of them in previous episode. They sound just like Drake. They sound just like some of the artists that come out. But again, there's been varying responses to this. A lot of artists and companies have struck these down, have done copyright bans, and I think they're kind of in uh, you know, sent right now in a little bit of a, a crisis mode, trying to figure out how to respond. There've also been some artists who've come out like Grimes, who've been a little bit more receptive to this saying, Hey, if you create a really awesome AI generated song using my voice and put it out there and it does well, I'll split the profits with you 50, 50. So we've seen a little bit of a disparity in, in re- or a, a spectrum, I should say in reactions there. Again, you can also imagine how tricky this gets even further. Now, when we start to bring in big companies, we start to bring in governments we start to bring in sensitive student information, intellectual property, some of those trade secrets, all those things. It gets very, very complicated. AI companies across the board, what I have seen over the past 19 weeks is they're trying. They're trying to take a lot of steps to mitigate this, um, adding things such as creating, you know, we've seen OpenAI and ChatGPT create options on there where you can ask questions, you can do some reporting and you can click options and add incognito mode so that it doesn't report your data it doesn't allow its data to be used for fine tuning. We've also seen some uh, AI plans that have created business options, which essentially keep the data private and don't use it. I think a lot of companies, though, are scared at this particular point to be able to endorse having their employees still using some of these AI tools. So I think it's going to continue to be a hurdle that tech companies have to figure out if they want these to be adopted by some of the highest paying entities, right? Governments, businesses, school districts. The issue around the public data piece is also going to continue to be very tricky because, as I mentioned, there's big companies right now that are in very, very tough fights in in places in particular like the European Union that have very strict data usage and data privacy requirements. And they are heavily pushing back on these AI companies who are training their models. And the, the way that they train their models is through data. It's through data that they use to train it. And it could end up leading to Worst case scenarios where tech companies may choose not to operate in certain places or or countries may not allow them to operate in certain places based on how they collect their data. So I think that there's a lot there to overcome. My predictions and hope across privacy? Well, my first hope is that through continued conversations and regulations with governments, my hope is that AI companies will find a middle ground and which will allow them to exist worldwide. My hope is that these the middle ground will actually create regulations, which number one, do actually protect us as the individual consumer, protect our data. I don't want those things to be compromised. We've already seen so many awful instances in which, you know, having our data publicly available has been a bad thing. We've seen just kind of like with social media targeted advertising, all those things continues to happen, right? Sometimes 
I do wonder if my cell phone's listening to me when sometimes I bring up something like, oh, I'm interested in getting a new pair of slippers or something like that. And then all of a sudden I'm scrolling Instagram and then I got all these slipper advertisements from Amazon or things like that to purchase. So we, again, inevitably we know some of these things are out there, but if there's real regulations we can take to be able to protect our data, I'm all for it. My hope though is, is that it also happens in a way which allows us to use these AI tools, which I do be, believe fundamentally are going to be something that can act as a force multiplier and really help our school communities. My second prediction and hope is that I believe that there's over the next few months here, if not already, I think there's going to be an emergence of what I would call boutique companies and boutique uh, just kind of plans within large tech companies that do focus, that hyper focus on privacy. And I think they're specifically going to target plans, options, tools for those big large entities, government entities, school district entities, business entities. And I think they're going to they're going to hyper emphasize uh, emphasize privacy. They're going to create things such as private servers or things like that, where let's say as an example, one thing we've learned is that there are companies out there which actually will create a chatbot that is trained on all of the, the data you have within or, or your organization. So imagine you took all of the meeting notes from every meeting you've ever had in your organization, all of your your uh, protocols, all of your plans, all of you, all of your onboarding plans, all those things, and then you trained it within the one of the chatbots within these private companies. And then the nice thing about it is it kind of serves as like a a human resource person. It all it also could serve as like a strategic partner for companies who are looking to use it to recall all of the information that exists across the org. Now that would be very terrifying to do under a very publicly available open AI Google policy or something like that. But if there's a very specific boutique company or a plan that a company could purchase through one of these large tech companies, which it ensures that all of this information was kept private on a private server and it was only intended for that company use, I think that there's probably a lot of entities that would be really receptive to it. And I do think it will happen. Lastly, my prediction and hope, I do uh, believe and hope that Education departments are going to, like, as I said before, they're going to need to provide guidance, frameworks, and recommendations on the extent to which schools and districts should be using AI tools. I think this is I, the reason I doubled down and, and mentioned this prediction again is because it is going to be very critical that they're teaching school districts how to use this without compromising student data, right? Things such as, again, recommending that you always use hypothetical scenarios, never using real information, using it only for uh, products or case uses where you're not using any sensitive student information or any sensitive school information. Um, that is my hope. I think that it is going to be very critical that we have educators, companies, we have government agencies that are showing our schools how to use this without compromising, you know, for any FERPA agreements, any sensitive student information. Longer term, my hope is that there will be meaningful legislation, government uh, legislation that is passed, which does clear hurdles around conventional data protections like FERPA in order to accommodate AI. I, l let me clarify this. I don't think FERPA is a bad thing. I think it's really important. Students have, it is very, of course, important that students and parents protect their data, right, and protect their information. But I do think that some of those current protections may be outdated and, and, are, and are not currently uh, thinking about the context of tools like AI information. So I think it's going to be really important that we are now writing in language to accommodate AI and what that looks like in the use cases there. My hope is that there's a way for us to do this where we can be able to leverage access that data within AI tools to support schools, to support school communities, to improve the experience without, of course, compromising the student data. I don't exactly know what that looks like, but I do believe that there's a middle ground. Again, potentially something like there being uh, a, a company that does offer a private server that becomes very popular with school districts. And a lot of school districts end up adopting private boutique servers, using chatbots, using some of these AI tools, knowing that all of that data is still behind this other firewall, this other layer of protection. All right, finally, let's talk about my favorite category. Some of the other things that we've learned here, the risks and opportunities. Well, first and foremost, I got to say, when I first started using AI, and as you all know, my, I, you know, it was January, it was, it was winter break. I had just pulled up a, a chat GPT after hearing about it in an article that I read and watching a YouTube video. And I was like, let me get it a shot. Completely blew my mind. I became totally obsessed with using it. I spent probably about 10 to 15 hours of time just 
exploring, experimenting with different prompts. I couldn't sleep. It compelled me and it motivated me so much that I started a podcast. So leaning into this, I got to say, I wasn't thinking too much about the risks. I was really, really just excited about some of the opportunities and, and the vision I saw for the future with AI tools based on the experience that I had initially. I would say prior to that, as I mentioned before, if you were talking to me about what I thought AI was, I was really thinking Terminator, right? I was thinking these autonomous robots that could cause harm to humanity and hurt us in some specific way. But that all of this has, has evolved quite a bit for me in the last 19 weeks. Let's start first with the risks and then we'll get to, we'll end with the opportunities here. Risk number one that I do see that I continues to worry me a little bit here based on AI tools. I do think that companies, my biggest worry is that uh, a lot of these tech companies will continue to focus only on growth and expansion, trying to monetize these tools, trying to ensure that people across the, uh, across the world are using them as much as possible. And they're not continuing to ensure that the quality of these tools the information of these tools is really strong and people are going to be starting to be using these tools quite a bit without doing fact checking, without implementing frameworks to use them. And then as a result, it's going to lead to a lot of situations where performance on a task or a role is actually worse than it would have been without the tool, potentially even high stake situations where that fake information led to something very poorly. Recently, as an example, I was reading an article about a lawyer who used chat GPT for a briefing, briefing that was then submitted to a judge. And apparently they ended up having to reprimand that lawyer. And I think there's even some uh, dialogue right now about what to do. I'll post the article um, on the show notes as well, because apparently the briefing that it generated, it referenced six cases um, within the brief and all of the cases were fake and never happened. So again, I think these types of things are real and can happen if we do not continue to be very vigilant about the information and we take all of these responses at face value I'm very worried about that as a potential risk here. The second potential risk, AI agents. I mentioned this in some of the other episodes. I also mentioned this in uh, a podcast I was recently able to uh, guest appear on, my EdTech life. Um, shout out Alfonso. Uh, AI agents continue to worry me. Just as a quick uh, context there, what is an AI agent? An AI agent is an autonomous AI bot, which operates freely, um, it is supposed to operate with some parameters, but, but high level, the idea there is that even with the parameters, it is running independently of humans, right? So it can run while humans are sleeping with the parameters. My big concern there is as those become more accessible, as people start to use AI agents uh, more, I think there's, it feels like there's a lot of potential uh, opportunities there to be able to use those irresponsibly by people. Um, and so I'm just worried about that. I'm worried about this type of technology which again, yet we don't fully understand. I know that in a, in a prior episode, I also shared a petition that I signed uh, because of, about putting a pause on some of these large language models and not innovating further than what we already have, even beyond GPT-4, because I do think across the entire world, humanity does need to take time to learn, really understand the capabilities of these tools, really put in frameworks into place. I think we're doing the best we can to kind of um, catch up with our feet here but I am worried about things such as AI agents and about how that has the potential to harm humanity rather than help it. Lastly, risk number three, I do think AI perpetuates gaps in education, which already exists. I think that's a real risk here. There's a lot of reasons why this could happen, right? I think one of the, the biggest fundament, fundamental reasons has nothing to do with AI, but AI can act as a catalyst to exacerbate this even further. Fundamentally, as we know, Education in the United States, the way the system has been designed, the origin of the systems, the way that the system continues to layer on policies, laws, all of these things compounded with things such as the cycle of poverty and equities across all different lines of industry, health, the way that communities are designed, the way that socioeconomic status plays a role into education, the opportunities that exist. All of these things are super complicated, but fundamentally what it means is that here in the United States, potentially in other countries as well, if AI is just released into the wild here, released into the landscape, likely what will happen is those communities that have more resources, financial resources, have networks, have the knowledge to be able to access things, have the educational privilege to be able to understand how these tools work, have the language privilege, they're going to be able to learn, become adapted, become a get ahead of these tools much faster than students in underserved communities. And that has the potential again to exacerbate 
some of those inequities which already exist. And I'm worried about that. And I think fundamentally what my hope is is that AI can end up becoming something which bridges the gap, not exacerbates the gap, but it is something that we have to figure out. We can't just assume that the tool in of itself is going to bridge the gap. We know that oftentimes when new opportunities are provided to education, if not done thoughtfully with implementation, it tends to, to do the former. It tends to exacerbate. Okay. We talked about some risks. Let's jump to opportunities now. Let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's let's put on our, our white hat and start to dream a little bit because I think that's important too. Opportunity number one that I think I've learned and I've realized based on everything that we've learned over the last 19 weeks. I think that AI will, can, should empower teachers to become whole again, not become burnout, burnt out vessels of themselves because they're so exhausted because they're at being asked to do so many things. And AI really can become that assistant, that support for a teacher throughout the week, throughout their daily experience. And it will do things such as helping to grade papers, helping to create lesson plans, helping to scaffold lessons, helping to create materials, helping to write those parent letters, helping to write letters of recommendation, helping to analyze financial aid letters, helping to handle all of those different contexts to do it. Because fundamentally what happens with teachers, and at least this was my experience, is when you're a teacher, you walk into a school, let's say 6, 6.30 a.m., sometimes even earlier, and over the course of the day, you're probably going to make 5,000 decisions. Small decisions, big decisions, medium-sized decisions. But at the end of the day, you feel like your brain has been taken, thrown into a microwave, and microwaved, and what now has been replaced and put back into your head is a dried up sponge and you're just so exhausted. You can't even function. You can't even make a decision because of how much thinking you had to do across every single facet there. If a, if AI allows teachers to make that 5,000 decisions, 2,000 decisions a day, I think you're going to get, you're going to get more full people. You're going to get people that come to work more excited to teach, more excited to focus on creating amazing experiences for students rather than just trying to survive because they're so exhausted. And my hope is that it leads to a more quality educational experience for both the teachers, the students, and the entire school. And I hope that it also acts as a force multiplier in school contexts where schools are understaffed and maybe need more support. And in the interim, they can hopefully use AI to help do that. Opportunity number two, I do think that AI does, hopefully, my hope, is that AI will do what the pandemic could not do. What do I mean by that? I mean permanently permanently transforming education, flipping education upside down, so that we we can really redefine what we believe that experience should look like. We can really redefine the skills that we believe students should learn and take away. And hopefully the emergence of AI actually finally allows us to do this, rather than still doing the same old seven period a day, in and out of school, English, math, science, history experience, which is outdated. It's archaic. It doesn't actually, we hear this from, I mean, I feel like everybody, right? That our public education system today is not setting up and teaching students the skills that they need for the future and the world that they're going to inherit. And I do believe that hopefully something like AI can finally just uproot the system and really put us in a position where we have to change the system and we can no longer just put in temporary measures and we can do this. My hope is that things such as the added time back that AI creates, as I mentioned through, you know, a teacher and all the things there, my personal hope is that with that time back, schools now can focus on teaching so many of those critical skills that I do believe students need to have to be successful in the real world. Episode three is all about this. I would invite you to go back and listen to that one if you are interested in this, but the skills high level that I do believe schools should be doubling down on rather than specifically focusing on content areas. And I do believe AI helps us to do this. Critical thinking skills, right? How do you think across lines of multiple content areas and solve very difficult problems? Teamwork and collaboration. How do you get along, right? With people different than you. Communicating across lines of different and disagreement, regardless of your political views, regardless of if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, let's talk to each other. Let's have conversations. Let's, let's be okay with disagreeing with each other sometimes. We have to do that. We're a very diverse society. We're not going to agree on every single issue. Does that mean we should hate each other and never get along and go to war? No, it means sometimes we have to have difficult conversations and sit in it 
and learn each other's perspectives. Schools need to be the places where students learn how to practice those skills and those muscles. Learning yourself. What am I good at? What do I value? What do I care about? What am I passionate about? What are my strengths? The schools are a great place to be able to do that. Unfortunately, a lot of schools today can't do that because they're so focused on content areas and they're focused on standardized tests. A lot of lucky students will enter a content area and really find and be awakened by a passion that they have. A lot of students don't. A lot of students leave their entire K-12 experience not even fully having awakened themselves to something that they're passionate about in the world. And so there is an opportunity for us to double down, expand our partnerships across business sectors, across other careers and vocations out there, and trying to expose students to more opportunities that exist in the world because AI is helping to take away some of the things that are are, are mundane, right? And, and time suckers for schools. Lastly, I think it's very critical that schools spend a lot of time teaching students very critical social emotional skills, things such as resiliency, embracing failure, navigating imposter syndrome. There's an opportunity to do that. Opportunity three, let's talk about the third opportunity that AI creates. AI creates new opportunities and sectors across the world for students to be excited by and to pursue and to hopefully make the world a better place. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, we oftentimes talk about how new technology can be a disruptive and lead to a loss of jobs, but I'd like to lean into the optimist side of this and say, well, what if it actually creates a lot of really cool fields, a lot of new things that don't exist now? I mean, I'm personally still really excited about that AI music producer field that I think at some point is going to lift off here. I mean, uh, some of the folks who've created some of these AI generated songs, I mean, they're really awesome songs and they've done them really fast. So I do, it just gets me really curious about some of the fields that are going to exist. I think too, with some of the upcoming episodes I have with some of the guests coming out, we're going to be able to envision even further the opportunities and experiences that, that exist for our young people to be able to implement AI in fields that don't even exist yet. And how exciting is that? And hopefully those fields can help us to solve some of the biggest problems that exist in our world today. That leads me to opportunity number four. Opportunity number four that I'm hopeful for, that I hope that AI does. I hope that AI helps humanity as a whole level up. I hope that what it does is it combines what humans do best, strategic thinking, reason. It takes our ability to do, do those two, two things with the ability that AI has to retain and capture the world's information so that we can solve the toughest problems that exist in the world and specifically in education. Here's some questions that I would love, 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 love somebody to figure out across using AI to solve some of the big problems we have in education. How do we create an equitable assessment system? How should we design our education system? This whole K-12 factory style system, it ain't working for me. I don't think it's working for a lot of people. Let's, let's change it up. How do we equitably, equitably allocate resources, right? If we only have a certain amount of money in the federal government pot or in the pot within our countries, how do we equitably allocate that across all of the different schools, higher ed entities that exist across the country? How can AI help us to create the most effective responses and solutions to major crises impacting our school communities? What am I talking about here? I'm talking about school shootings. I'm talking about the fentanyl outbreak. And I'm talking about social media and technology addiction. I believe that AI in the hands of very, very intelligent people who are committed to using these to strategically plan, I do believe that it can help us to pressure test and create very thoughtful solution that we're not currently leveraging. And that's my hope. That's my hope for that opportunity. Okay, let's talk about a couple of predictions and hopes that I have in this risks and opportunity field. Well, first we'll start with the risks and then we'll get into some of the predictions I hope as it relates to the opportunity, as it relates to the risks. <sighs> I don't know how to, I don't know how to break the news to you all, but I'm very, very confident of this prediction. I hope I end up being wrong, but I, I don't think I'm going to be wrong about this prediction. I do predict over the next 12 months, probably sooner, we are going to see AI products create deep fake images, videos, or text that ends up significantly impacting a very high stakes event. I'm thinking an election. I'm thinking another world event or a world conflict. And unfortunately, I do think that that's going to happen where there's going to be some media, just as we saw with social media and the impact it has had on things there, I do think it's going to happen. 
My hope is that it doesn't. My hope is that we've learned our lesson. But unfortunately, I do believe that there is going to be some AI produced products <laughs> that end up impacting one of these things. And then that's going to lead to a lot of dialogue, potentially a backlash, some regulation that happens there. So I hope that we can get ahead of that. I don't really want us to see you know, the, the dark underbelly of AI and how it can impact negatively impact a lot of those things in society, which again, it can. Let's talk about my predictions and hopes for the opportunity side of this. At the start of the next school year, I do think we'll be discussing a use case around AI in schools that we aren't currently discussing, a tech breakthrough or case study which encourages adoption. I'm really excited about it. I can't wait. A lot of the dialogue right now has been around chatbots. It's very specifically been around chatbots as it relates to things such as lesson planning, being able to scaffold the teacher experience, being able to uh, do things such as revamp the uh, student assignments. I don't think, I think that's just like the one to 5% though of how AI can actually permeate into education over the next few months. I can't wait to see other ways that we discover that AI tools can be used in education. And I have a feeling we're going to get so much deeper. Let me, let me uh, offer another prediction that's similar, but not exactly the same. I think over the next few months, uses of AI are going to extend beyond chatbots. I think we've talked a lot about chatbots and a lot about the use cases of chatbots in schools. I'd be willing to bet though that in the future, we're going to talk a lot more relentlessly about human and technology integrations. I've, I've in the last couple of episodes shared a couple of ways that we've already learned about how AI and machine learning are being implanted within devices and people to do things such as like helping them walk, helping them think, helping to predict mind simulations or things like that. I'm very curious to see how that continues to ramp up and how that continues to make its way into education. Um, I think the second thing is I'm very curious to see how AI manifests itself in physical representations such as robots. We know that New York this summer is is preparing to unleash a bunch of robots into, into high densely populated areas like subway stations and Times Square that are powered by AI in order to do some uh, monitoring related to uh, vandalism. And so we'll see how physical representations of AI continue to show up. And I'd be willing to bet we're going to talk a lot about that too. Um, and the conversation is going to diverge a little bit from just chatbots and just those types of use cases. Lastly, I do think, and I'm excited about this too. I'm excited to see what it looks like. I do think across higher education and CTE programs within K-12 to institutions, I think we're going to see an explosion of AI-facing programs which I got to say, I'm pretty excited for. I know that a couple of months ago, we saw that Texas, uh, University of Texas and Austin was kind of uh, opening one of the first of its kind, you know, machine learning AI type master's degree program that it was existing, existing. I think it was like an online program. I haven't heard much yet. Then again, I haven't been looking for it too specifically. So there may be others that pop up, but I do imagine that over the next few months here, especially in the summer as higher ed uh, entities continue to develop frameworks and, and uh, curriculums for this, I would imagine that we're going to see a lot more courses, a lot more majors, a lot more just degrees and certifications around AI. Okay. That being said, I'm very curious to hear what your predictions are. Thanks so much for taking some time with me today to allow me to reflect upon all of the learning that we have as a community have done together over the last uh, 19 weeks. It's been a tremendous ride thus far. I'm really excited to continue to go on this journey with you as we learn more about AI and we work together in service of our students. Now, my wife keeps telling me that I should consider adding a closing uh, to my episodes. And so I'm going to try this one on for size. Feel free to let me know what you think. This is Daniel from the AI at Convo. I want to remind you that curiosity opens source, connections build bridges, learning paves the way, and humans are at the heart of AI education. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the AI Education Conversation. Give a follow, rate, and review wherever you listen. For all show notes and to share your thoughts on today's episode, check out the AI Ed Convo on Twitter. See you next time.